Dear listeners, good morning and welcome to Comme d'Archi, the podcast that opens the doors to the fascinating world of architecture. For newcomers, let me introduce myself. I'm the spokesperson of Anne-Charlotte Despont, PhD in History of Architecture, published author, head of a communication and development agency based in Paris, France, dedicated to architecture. Let's meet every week to discuss culture and architecture with specialists and learn how to look at projects through a context and diversity lens. Thank you for being with me today, and now it's time for talent. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archi. Hi everybody, good afternoon, Gary Shelley. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very honored to welcome you to the Comme d'Archi podcast with Laure Chung, your collaborator. Good afternoon, Laure. Good afternoon, and Charlotte. Thank you for being here today. We are in connection, Gary in your London office, me and Laure in Paris, thanks to the sound engineering of Julien Rebourg. Gary, you are one of the principals of the Kassenmann Agency in London. First, would you present your office and tell us more about the history of Kassenmann? Would you give us some news of the two founders Diana Casson and Roger Mann. Yep, hi. Um, yes, so Roger and Diana set up the office about 30 years ago. Um, they're interior designers. Um, we're an office of interior designers. Um, and I think some of the first projects they had were, you know, retail design and sort of office design. But then they had a project to do with the V&A, with the Victoria and Albert Museum. And slowly from projects like that, they started to specialise in museum and exhibition design. Um, I mean, we still do interior design, but, but most of our work now um, exists in the museum and exhibition design field. Um, I, I guess to add to that, um, Dinah's now retired um, and uh, Roger has taken over um, as the main director. And then we have four other directors, such as myself, um, with Roger. Okay. And uh, what was your background on how did you get into this iconic agency? Um, well, my background um, is from a design education. So I did a degree in design and then a master's in design, specializing in interior design. And um, I think I graduated in, um, in England. I, I graduated in Manchester just in time for like the really big recession about 20 years ago. There was sort of no work in the UK. So um, I went abroad and worked in Taiwan uh, for a Chinese architectural practice, just practicing. I was doing interior design. I was doing garden design and a bit of, um, uh, a bit of architecture. Um, and it was on returning back to London, one of the first jobs that I had was with an exhibition design company, um, you know, utilized my interior skills, really. And I've, you know, for now over 20 years, I've been working in museum and exhibition design. Mm -hmm. I love this new question. Do you feel today that you have accomplished what you imagined when you left school? Wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's interesting. I, I mean... I think when I was at school, I always loved being in the art room, in the art department, and always wanted to do something in the arts, but didn't know quite what because of I didn't quite understand interior design. Then when I was studying design, I always wanted to, to work in a field where I was doing new contemporary design, but working in a kind of historic context. Um, so I, th I think sort of museum design and exhibition design is almost the perfect fit for that. I mean, I love the whole kind of idea of building narratives um, and and working with objects and working with architecture, uh, but creating an interior. So, I mean, it is almost the perfect fit, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, could you explain emblematic projects of the office on your own projects inside? Um, well, I guess... Um, One of the first emblematic projects of, of Cass and Mann was the British galleries at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which were about 3,000 square meters of um, gallery space um, dealing with um, the decorative arts um, in Britain in, I think, sort of 
17th or maybe it started in the 15th century up to the, about the 19th century and I mean that won lots of awards it won lots of notice it got Casimir noticed uh, there, there was you know some radical things in it for the time like there was audio visual mixed in with objects which at that period w was was fairly a, a radical thing to do in a traditional museum I think the next big project that got Casaman noticed was the um, Churchill War Rooms, uh, which was a biographical space about Winston Churchill. And here, multimedia or media, digital media was used much more extensively and really dictated the sort of style and pace of the gallery. And again, that, that won lots of awards. And, uh, and, and from that, we, we've sort of built this sort of foundation of being able to take on projects that have a mix of objects and, and multimedia um, and different sorts of media and sort of gel them together into a sort of cohesive um, narrative. I guess um, the, the particular projects that I've worked on, uh, I've, I did the, uh, uh, oh, that's Hollywood costume at the Victoria and Albert Museum is one project. And uh, that was an interesting project from the point of view of, uh, I, I guess, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, you can more or less guarantee that every object you might display might be beautiful. Uh, and a lot of their exhibitions are based on the beauty of the objects, whereas this particular exhibition, none of the objects were beautiful. They, they were clothes that were used um, in film. Um, and they kind of didn't make much sense on their own. So we, again, used a lot of digital media to, to sort of put the character back into the clothes and, and create and, and make a story um, and make sense, really, of, of, of this collection. Uh, so, and, you know, from a museum that was at first reticent for using multimedia, this was more or less a complete multimedia show. It, it was, um, and it, it proved to be um, very popular at the time. Um, I guess um, at the same time I was working on that, I was working, uh, I started working on La Cité du Vin um, with Law uh, in Bordeaux. And so I, that, that was a five year project, you know, more or less full time um, because of the scale of it. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that, that was great to start from being in a place where there was nothing, there was no building to having not only a building, but, but a sort of a 3000 square meter exhibition narrative about um about wine and man and i've also worked on the natural history museum the the hanging of the whale in the main space of the natural history museum in london and i generally work around the office as well i help out on concept ideas and um pitches so uh you know it, we, we just don't sort of fence ourselves off into one particular project. We, we take responsibility for individual projects, but we still work across the board and sort of help each other out if and when necessary on other projects. Um, could you explain how you win some project in France? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, La Cité du Vin was the first. Um, and I mean, it was a surprise to us that we won it, to be quite honest. Um, there, you know, uh, we it was a an open competition, uh, and I guess it was a competition that was anonymous as well. But you know, for the idea of English designers um, designing a project about wine in France, we we thought that it was completely unlikely that you know <laughs> that that we would uh, we would get this project. Um, I think we probably had a very good translator that disguised the fact that we were maybe English um, for, for our documents, but. Um, you know, I, I, this idea of level competitions, I think, helps us quite a lot, uh, you know, and it, it was just a project, I think, that really appealed to us. Uh, we'd started working on a few projects like it, this idea of projects that are about ideas rather than about collections, about museum collections. And um we had been exploring a few projects along that line that we, we we hadn't won, and then when the one came up in in France, we we put a lot of effort into it. Um, and I think, you know, I think that there's that, that there was a certain th uh, thinking um, and the 
and sort of way we were designing that I think appealed to the client. And I think a couple of those things that appealed to clients in France was how we were working with the architects and how we were working with the architecture and that there was a synthesis between us and the architects. Um, and um, I think the other thing that might have appealed was just the fun that we had with it, that we really, you know, imaginatively really went for it um and i you know i i think that's how we won that project um certainly english people are the best wine lovers all over the world <laughs> yes we got the reputation of being the one of the biggest import markets for wine i think yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and i think also historically i i guess the relationship between the uk or britain and bordeaux you know there's a, a a historic relationship there that goes back to you know richard the lionheart um you know the plantagenets and um and <laughs> trade from then on um <laughs> good and um what is the main differences between the interior design and the scenography uh I think how how we work is um, as interior designers. I think we're very particular about materiality and form, and and we pay a, a close attention to that. And and say at, like at La Cité de Vau, we try to make forms that were representative of of each of the subjects that we were um, exploring, each of the subjects that we were presenting, and those forms have, um, you know. It's just not a shape that you see. It's a texture that you touch. It's the materials that you can see that it, um, that it's made from. But then it's also the media and how the media works in that uh, particular piece of furniture or that particular space that I think distinguishes, you know, one of our projects that you have this synthesis of, you know, object, space, furniture, material and media um, all to try and harness this Uh, all these tools in the service of of the narrative and and the idea that needs to be communicated um, to to the public. Mm -hmm. And one of the main challenge, uh, if uh, I have to add to this project, is that that needs to be twenty module that we design that should all looks different, with a different approach and different um, visitor experience. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was hard not to run out of energy on some of those meetings that you would get, you know, day two of the meeting and you're still only on module 11 or something. And you you think, well, I've got another, you know, so, you know, the, but I think it was, yeah, the difference of each module. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, I guess the fun we had with it, we, you know, there's there's sometimes a lot of humor in our work. And I think that sort of helps with communication, um, you know, to, to the public. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the main differences between the English and French working methods? Ah. Yes, well, I mean, well, the main dif difference for us is that we're a kind of medium sized office. And uh, as far as I understand in France, I don't think there's sorts of an office that's our size you either get quite small offices or you get very quite large offices um and so when we are often competing against other french companies that they, they seem to be often groups of um co-contractors you know they, they would put um, a group of uh, individuals together whereas we're actually an office of 20 um that, uh, and 20 people that have worked together for a long time and we feel we have quite a lot of creative capital and a sort of synthesis of the way that we work um together and um, I, i think you know that that's that's one of the differences um i think when actually on the ground working on projects in france um there's I think there's a difference in the amount of trust and the amount of responsibility you get as a designer in France compared to maybe the UK. I think in the UK, they structure projects slightly differently that clients hire project managers and they hire cost consultants um, that are all work for the client. Um, and they kind of, as a designer, you have to report to them um whereas often in the projects in france we we've been in control of that ourselves um you know um and so you know so i think those are sorts of differences i think 
when we work as a groupment um, with some of our colleagues in France, we, we work as co-contractors, um, you know, so lighting design, graphic design, structural design, engineering are our co-contractors, whereas in England, those contractors would be subcontractors. So sort of in the UK, you would take responsibility as the lead designer for all your other um, subcontractors, whereas in France, it's more of a collaboration. Um, so, you know, both projects have their, both ways of working have their good points and bad points. Um, it's just, in, you know, interesting that, that those sort of slight differences. Okay. And is uh, there a country where you have felt real barriers in your work? Ah, well, I don't know, actually. I'd like to think there isn't. I mean, we've, um, you know, I, I think it's, to us, it's a surprise, but it's a very nice surprise that we get on very well in France. Um, you know, that we, we seem to like work, we like working there, um, and clients like our work. Um, I don't think in any of the other countries that we've worked in, we've had such a surprising rapport with, um, you know, with the with the country that we we work in and you know and it, it's not like we feel that we're french or anything we still feel sometimes very british when we're in france um but but that's you know in in some ways it doesn't stop us it, it, you know it's still you know there's some things that we don't understand about contracts scenarios and things in france but 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 it still is and you know laws obviously there she helps us out tremendously on that sort of front um But I, I think um, I don't think we've worked in other countries as successfully as we we work in France. There seems to be something there, some some mysterious factor um, that maybe we shouldn't um, look too deeply into. I think but, is, you know, um, it is great. It might be a barrier of about languages, but languages it, this is not a real barrier. Mm. And I have to add that creativity for us, there's no barrier at all. Mm -hmm. It's not limited with um, countries. I think when we started La Cité du Vin, I, I think I was using Google Translate. <laughs> I, I think it was. I think the client thought we were complete idiots. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's a. Uh, but you know, I think it's it's just working with clients and and client having trust in you and being completely open um, mm -hmm. and you know working in an open. Um, collaborative way, which is what we like doing. Open discussion as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the most amazing in your work? The most amazing aspect of our work uh, or of working in, in the job or the most amazing bit of work that we've done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I, th I think, you know, the most amazing aspect of being a, an exhibition and museum designer is working with the, the sort of museums, with, with clients that have these stories to tell and you getting a behind the scenes sort of privileged uh, journey into those stories so when you're in a museum and you're seeing back of house and you see the collections in the collection stores and and you're talking direct to curators that have all this knowledge and they're talking back to you and you're you know you're pushing ideas around um and you know when you're working in fantastic buildings that you get to go into them and you go you know up into the ceiling of Westminster Abbey or you you know there's you know these amazing spaces that you get access to that, that the public don't get access to and you know and say something like Cité du Vin the research that we did for that with the client you know visiting chateaus visiting wine makers all those sorts of behind the scenes things are you know you some days you think wow this you know you, you pinch yourself that you're, you're having such a great day that you know it doesn't feel like work it feels it feels like just an amazing honor um so i think that's definitely the good side of our 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 career path really um you know it's something i enjoy and also meeting all passionate people telling all mm. the story mm. Mm. Um, do you have a funny story for us? 
<laughs> You've oh, not been know. prepared for this question, right? Uh, yeah. No, I'm not prepared for that question. I think, you know, there's... I'm not sure, to be quite honest. I mean, I, I, I do think, I look back on before we, you know, when we first started Cité de Vin and how, you know, slightly naive we were about the way that we could work in France... And, you know, I sometimes think that's funny, but it could have been a disaster, I suppose. But it wasn't. Um, <laughs> luckily, we, we, we've, you know, we've got law helping us, uh, working <laughs> with us. Um, so, you know, I, haven't, I can't think of a particularly funny story. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's quite a tricky one, isn't it? That? <laughs> Um, what is the atmosphere in your beautiful office on the organization of the team? Um, well, I think the, the sort of atmosphere, I think when you work with designers, you know, from the junior designer up to the senior designer, um, everyone takes responsibility for their work, don't they? It, it's not like sometimes other offices where you have to really... You know, you you don't have to police anything. It, it you know people, you know designers love designing and they they love you know sort of generally love working um, at, at the design. So just to be among people that are are all pushing and working hard is nice. Um, we don't have a sort of strict hierarchy in the office um, that everyone tends to do a bit of everything. You know, if you took say Roger for example who's the big director um he tends to make a lot of models um he ten <laughs> you know he must be the highest paid model maker uh, in a sort of in anybody's office but that you know but it's it's one of the tools of communication that he uses um he enjoys doing them and they they help projects along so so it, it's not like the you know the junior makes the models and the director directs it, often things are, are are other other way around and so we don't stand on hierarchy um we we work by collaboration and you know i think everyone's working hard but everyone's also hopefully enjoying themselves um and you know that that's tends to be the atmosphere okay thank you um What is your feeling about the scenography in the future because of the frugality subject on sustainable design too? All right. I guess um, there is going to be a post-COVID world, but museums are going to have to face this and still move forward. So there will still be projects. Um, how they're structured, they might be a little bit less money for them. I'm not sure, but... If you look in different countries, uh, you know, there, there are different, different sorts of projects. There are, you know, new, amazing ideas popping up all the time. So I think, I think life will go on. Um, hopefully, you know, as you, you know, you mentioned sustainability. This is obviously crucial to, to what we do. Uh, there's so many different ways to be more sustainable. And, you know, we all take notice of this. Um, so projects new projects will still always be be there on the cards i think you know looking hopefully um mm -hmm. you know if, if anything lockdown has proved you know people are desperate to go and do things you know and you can only do so much in on screen and at home and people want to get out and do real things you know see real objects be in real spaces mix with other people um and you know museums are, are perfect for that really What advice would you give to design students today? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> design or scenography students? Yes, I mean, there, there aren't necessarily specific um, scenographic courses, I don't think. There might be one in the UK. But generally, you know, we take on interior design students. And for us, it's always you know, talking to students that have understood an idea and followed it through, you know, to to the, the biggest conclusion that they can take it and if they can explain it back to you, you know. So it's always about trying to understand what you're doing um, and then doing it with passion. Uh, so 
and and then the next best thing they can do is try and make some contacts in design agencies and get you know get interviews um and get some work um but uh i mean i think i when i left my degree i didn't really have much of a clue what i wanted to do or how to do it it was only really after doing an ma that i i felt you know a much stronger bond with design um and a clearer idea of what design was uh so sometimes to students i say stay being a student um because it's you know you can the more you learn the better <laughs> so anything else the last um, word <laughs> the last word uh, i'm not sure your future project all over the world all right oh good yes yeah that's um so we've got um well we're working on two projects in france at the moment um one is the Uh, the Maritime Museum in Paris. Um, so that opens next year, is it? Finished? 2022. 22, yeah. Yep. Um, we have a project in Champagne, which is more yes. or less finished now that should open this summer. So they're exciting. Um, there's also, I'm working on the new Holocaust galleries at the Imperial War Museum in London. So mm. they should be open this year. So... You know, there's a lot of exciting stuff that we're doing. Um, we're obviously looking for more exciting stuff to do. Um, and, you know, looking potentially for other countries to do it in. Um, Brexit potentially isn't helping us much. Uh, but, uh, you know, pre-Brexit, it was always so easy. Now it might be slightly more difficult. Um, but we're, we're trying to face that challenge. Mm -hmm. so and we are probably looking for more projects In France, then. In France, definitely. <laughs> um. Many, many thanks, Gary and Laure, for your confidence. I wish you the best and for your beautiful office. Bye-bye, everybody, and see you next Wednesday for our new Comdarchy in English. Take care of yourself. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in to our previous content on Instagram at Comdarchi Podcast. If you like it, make sure to promote the podcast by giving it five stars on Apple Podcast and adding a comment or on any of your favorite podcast platforms. And don't forget to subscribe and listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon. And until then, take care of yourself.